first and foremost, you got to know that intelligence is socially constructed. And we've talked about this a little bit before, but what does it mean when something is socially constructed? What that means is society or your culture gives that its definition and qualities. So if intelligence um, in our culture might mean kind of more of book smart intelligence. Maybe it means going to college. How we define intelligence in the United States or in our community isn't the same as maybe how intelligence is defined in Kenya or in India or Malaysia. And so different cultures have different ways of measuring, talking about, and thinking about intelligence. It's not like a universal concept necessarily. And so for our purposes, when we're talking about intelligence here in AP Psych, we're going to talk specifically about the mental quality consisting of the actual ability to learn from experience, so kind of to take in new information, to solve problems, so basically using that learning to solve and come up with solutions, and then using that knowledge to adapt to new situations. So there's three kind of prongs to the type of intelligence that we're talking about. And then the other thing that gets thrown a lot, thrown around a lot in this unit is this idea of IQ. And yes, you can get like an IQ number, right? You can take a test, it'll give you a number, but it's not something that you have. It's not necessarily like a trait or characteristic of yours that doesn't necessarily say anything necessarily about your qualities or anything like that. It's just a, a representation of a score that you got on a test one time. It's not an inherent quality or characteristic. The first theorist that you need to know is named Charles Spearman and he's pictured here. And basically his belief or his theory is that intelligence is basically just one common skill underlying all of our behavior. And so he would say that you either have a high intelligence or a low intelligence, but it's one singular score. We wouldn't break it down into, I'm kind of smart in math, but not so smart in English or something like that. He would just say, nope, you either have a high score or a low score, but it's one score. And he um, measures that with the letter G, which is why I have the, um, the small G up there. It's called the G factor on, um, sometimes. So the G factor is your score. And that's basically what he would say defines whether or not you're intelligent or not. And so how he comes to this conclusion is through a process of factor analysis. Basically, we look at a bunch of data and we identify different clusters of related information. And then using those clusters, we can give like a, a numerical score. So in this case, the numerical score is your G factor. And so he would say that if someone scores high in verbal intelligence, they may also score high in mathematics. It's more of a common underlying factor. So that's Spearman. And so again, these are theorists. Some have more validity than others, and we'll kind of look at that as we continue to go. So he's important. You should know that specifically like G factor is also important. Continuing on with this, there's LL Firstone. He's the next theorist that you need to be familiar with. So he gave 56 different tests. So, and instead of coming up with one specific number, he gave seven clusters of numbers. And so he would say, instead of having one underlying specific skill that we have spatial ability, Numerical ability, those are like math skills, right? Word fluency, which re relates to vocab and English and things like that. And so he's not necessarily the opposite of Spearman, but he just looks at intelligence in a different way. And so instead of ranking people on a single scale, he used those seven different clusters to score people high or low, depending on their scores. However, what Thurstone's results actually show us is that people who tended to excel in one area also tended to excel in another area. So even though he didn't necessarily believe in the G factor or in Spearman's idea, he actually has evidence that supports the G factor because he found that generally speaking, people who scored high or scored low across all of the categories. The next person that we need to talk about is Gardner. Gardner has a theory of multiple intelligences. And so this is different than Thurstone in a few ways. Um, Gardner says we don't have any single underlying factor, so he would disagree with um, Spearman and say there's no G factor. And basically, he looked at the idea that, you know, some people can be savants. And what a savant is, is someone who maybe has low skills in one area, but really, really high skills in another area. And so he uses this information to argue that 
Well, obviously, if savants exist, then there isn't one single underlying factor for intelligence, that there instead would be multiple factors. And so his, though, definition of intelligence is much more broad. Thurstone was looking at like math skills, reading skills, spatial skills, whereas Gardner, and this is the key to making sure you know the difference, Gardner is going to talk about like interpersonal skills, so like your skills at building relationships or your kinesthetic skills that has to do with like your body movement or your musical skills. So those are like less maybe academic than what we normally think of when we think of intelligence. And so he has a broader array of clusters. However, even though we study Gardner and we talk about this recent factor analysis research, so we've done some clusters, we've studied the, the different areas, still um, comes to the, down to the fact that we think that G matters. There is some sort of general underlying cause. Obviously, when we talk about people who are savants, there's always outlying cases and things that don't fit the norm, quote unquote. But um, in general, the G factor matters. G matters. So that's what you kind of have to come away with. You still need to know these other theorists and their beliefs. But what we come down to is that the G is probably important. Next thing is Sternberg. And so Sternberg should matter to you as an AP Psych student because what Sternberg believes about intelligence is becoming more and more used in college admissions process. Sternberg has a broader, more holistic picture to traditional intelligence. And so instead of just like book smarts, Sternberg takes into account analytical skills, creati creative skills, and practical skills. And so if you've ever had to write, more colleges are having you write essays that maybe are on topics that show creativity more. And so colleges believe that students who score high across these three criteria, um, it's a really good predictor of future success. And so if colleges can look at your creative, practical, and analytical skills and make a determination of whether or not you're a good candidate, um, then they can better predict who to let into school and who might need more support. And so as colleges begin to accept this more and more, you may start to see more practical skills on college applications. And then the last kind of type of intelligence that we have to talk about is emotional intelligence. And so emotional intelligence isn't necessarily our book smart or our college admissions, that sort of thing, but it is an aspect of social intelligence. And you might, now we're not talking necessarily about G factor. You might have a high G factor, but you might score really low at emotional intelligence. So these are different categories of things that we're talking about. And emotional intelligence is made up of four main components. And basically what they have to do with are how we perceive emotions. Like, can we actually recognize emotion? Do we understand emotions? And are we able to predict how they change and blend? Can we manage emotions and how to express them in different situations? And then are we also able to use them? So people who are really skilled in music and arts and drama would probably score really high in the emotional intelligence scale because they are able to use emotion, convey it, understand it. And what studies actually show us is that people who rank high in emotional intelligence skills um, tend to have a better job performance and they tend to be better at marriage and parenting, which kind of makes sense. If you can relate to someone and understand their emotions on a deeper level, um, then you probably get along and have better, smoother relationships. So how does the brain play a role in our intelligence? Well, the phrase bigger is better actually has some credence here when we're talking about intelligence. And so basically, there is a correlation between brain size and your intelligence score. So if we look at this image here, we've got the newborn brain up to about two years old. And what that shows is important. In the newborn brain, those are, those are neurons, right? The dendrites are the spiky things sticking out. The, the axons are the long things. Um, what those are showing is the cortical or the neural connections in the brain. And so in a newborn, we know that they don't have as many of those connections because we know that experience helps grow those connections. And you can see as the baby ages, more and more neurons fill the space. Well, the more neurons you have, 
the heavier that your brain is. And so if we could weigh, and we'd have to weigh it at a very, very finite scale, like in micro micrograms, right? Um, but people who have higher intelligence scores, brains tend to weigh a little bit. Not like we would be able to look at your head and say, oh yeah, that brain looks heavier. But if we actually weighed them out, you know, on a very minute, um, specific scale, we would actually see a difference in weight because those people who are more intelligent have more neural connections in their brain, which makes their brain slightly heavier. And so we associate intelligence with ample gray matter, which is the, the neural cell bodies, and the white matter, which is the axons, which means that your brain basically communicates more efficiently over time. And so what that leads us to is that basically smart people's brains function more. And so more efficiently, more quickly, more communicatively, those are different things that smart, traditionally smart intelligence people people with a high G factor, their brains function better. And so there is a correlation that exists there. We can look at it, that intelligence and speed of processing is about plus 0.3 to plus 0.5. So it's not a super strong correlation, but there is a relationship that exists. However, when we say correlation, excuse me, remember that we're talking about not causation, but that there's a relationship that exists. So it could be that people who process information more quickly, if your brain processes more quickly, you actually accumulate more knowledge over time because it's quicker and you can take more stuff in. Or there could be another underlying factor like genetics that leads you to have a higher intelligence and a higher processing speed. So we can't say that one causes the other, but we do know that a relationship does exist between um, intelligence and perceptual speed and brain weight as well. Another interesting thing to look at is the correlation between intelligence and later income levels. And so I think this is important because you can see that there is a relationship there. The scores are clustered together. They form sort of a line that ascends upwards. The higher your intelligence, the higher that your income becomes. However, it's not a super strong correlation, right? There's people down in the 80s, which is a fairly low intelligence score, a fairly low IQ score, making, you know, $180,000 a year, which is like tons of money, right? And so it doesn't always work out that way. There might be a slight correlation there, but you're also not completely bound by your genetics. There could be other circumstances at play that allow you to like, you know, overachieve based on your kind of genetically inherited intelligence.